Firstly, a special shout out to Emma Chester for suggesting this case. Hopefully you find it informative. I also need to begin this video with a warning. I've covered rapists before on this channel, but David Carrick is something else. His crimes are truly horrific and are against multiple women over almost 20 years. I'll go into graphic detail about his offending in order to highlight just how evil this man is. If this is going to distress you, then please end the video now. Ultimately, your mental health is much more important than views. If you do need to click off, then I completely understand and want to thank you for stopping by. Anyway, on with the video. In March 2021, the nation was in shock when 33-year-old Sarah Everard was abducted, raped and murdered by Wayne Cousins, a serving Metropolitan Police officer. Cousins was an extremely dangerous man, a sexual deviant and a grave danger to women. People were horrified that a monster like that was employed in the police and asked whether there were any more evil men amongst their ranks. The public would soon get their answer. In October 2021, just a few days after Wayne Cousins was sent to prison for the rest of his life, the police knocked on the door of another serving officer, one who worked for the same force and in the same unit as Cousins. His name was David Carrick, and his arrest brought to an end a campaign of violence, rape, degradation and control against multiple women over almost two decades. As if this wasn't sickening enough, concerns were known about Carrick for years, with complaint after complaint being made about his behaviour, but they were all ignored. Welcome to Evil Among Us. David Carrick was born on the 4th of January 1975 in the city of Salisbury in Wiltshire, a county located in the southwest of England. Initially, Carrick lived with his mother Jean and his father, whose name has not been published, on an army base in Salisbury called Bulford Camp, due to the latter being in the British Army. After the birth of his younger sister in 1977, the family moved to the village of Durrington, again in Wiltshire, where Carrick spent the majority of his childhood. He attended Durrington Comprehensive School and was apparently a popular pupil. A former classmate later stated, quote, He was a lovely lad at school. I can't say he wasn't because he was. Everybody loved him. They added, He treated girls nicely back then. Carrick was a keen sportsman and had a passion for martial arts, with him obtaining a black belt in taekwondo. In a pre census report compiled for the court years later, Carrick stated that, Despite his outward smiling appearance at school, his home life was dysfunctional, with him stating that both of his parents drank and he was neglected from a young age. Family members have come out to say that this is a lie, but I think it's actually the truth, and I will explain why in a moment. Things changed completely when Jean and Carrick's father separated and divorced in his early teens. Then, when Carrick was around 14 or 15 years old, Jean began a relationship with a man called Alex Mann Clark who soon moved into the family home. Here, he would regularly beat Jean, with Carrick often hearing this and sometimes witnessing it. Jean later confirmed that her son had seen her being assaulted and tried to intervene with her reporting, quote, a couple of times when he was hitting me, David would come into the bedroom and shout, leave my mum alone. Jean also confirmed during this time that she drank to excess to deal with the abuse. Carrick left the family home likely due to this situation when he was 16 years old and moved to the town of Amsbury with two female friends. He did have contact with his mother regularly and given that Jean stated that Alex Mann Clark beat her repeatedly over the course of their 12-year relationship, it seems likely that Carrick would have witnessed his mother being abused again and again. The divorce between his mother and father and her relationship with Alex Mann Clark led to a change in Carrick's demeanour and this was noticed by his friends. He became more sullen and introverted, and the same classmate who commented before stated that Carrick blamed his mother for the divorce and choosing an abusive man over his father. Carrick's resentment towards his mother only got worse when she had two children with Alex Mann Clark. Jean stated that Carrick resented the children and never got on with them. She also claimed later that they disclosed that he'd physically assaulted them. Jean said, quote, He just didn't like my other kids. Maybe it's jealousy or something, or maybe he blamed me for the breakup of our marriage. 
This last comment highlights quite an important issue in this case, Jean's perception of her son's childhood. She stated that his childhood was, quote, normalish, and others within the family have been quick to condemn Carrot's claims about neglecting the home as being malicious lies intended to gain sympathy from the sentencing judge. One relative went as far as stating that Carrick had a, quote, very happy childhood. This is clearly not true. Watching your mum being beaten by a partner is not normal. It's important at this stage to begin to explain the profile of David Carrick to understand the monster he became and the crimes he committed. David Carrick likely did exaggerate things in order to get sympathy and reduce his own sentence in court years later, but this doesn't mean that what he was saying at its core wasn't true. I cannot comment too much on the relationship between Jean and Carrick's biological father, but if her relationship with Alex Mann Clark was any indicator of the marriage, then it's likely that Carrick was exposed to things no child should ever see and potentially neglected due to the alcohol use of one or both parents. The impact of this is at the absolute core of Carrick's offending, and that is his absolute hatred of women. His former classmate was right. Carrick clearly blamed his mother for the breakdown of the relationship with his father and for her decision to be in a relationship with an abuser. Add on top of this, resentment about being neglected during his earlier childhood and his mother having two further children, which he was likely jealous of because he felt they were being treated better than he ever was. At the time of her interview with the Guardian newspaper in 2023, Jean said that her son had cut contact with her approximately 15 years ago. To cut your own mother completely out of your life is massive, and I think this shows how much Carrick hated his mother. He wanted nothing to do with her at all. This perception of his mother tainted his view of all women. The term hatred is too tame a word in this case. David Carrick despised women. He saw them as less than human and wanted to punish, hurt, and degrade them in any way that he could as a form of punishment for them simply being female but also as a way to vent his anger about his mother, who he believed had let him down. In order to do this, he raped them, and there's a repeated theme of Carrick raping his victims anally, an act I have no doubt was intended to cause him as much physical pain as possible. However, there was another impact of his childhood. If David Carrick was neglected, and I believe he was, he would have likely grown up with low self-esteem, a sensitivity to rejection, and difficulties coping on his own, and so would be desperate to be in relationships so that he had someone to be dependent on and would control those unlucky enough to end up with him so they didn't leave him. In order to achieve and maintain dominance over these particular women and punish them for any sign of dissent, not only would he resort to his default strategy of raping them, but he would do whatever it took to utterly destroy and degrade them to make sure they didn't leave him. And that is the contradiction and danger of David Carrick. He's a man who utterly despised women and would seek any opportunity to find females to harm as a form of punishment. However, he also needed women in his life because he was, like all domestic abusers, too weak to cope on his own and he would also seek out women for this purpose. As you'll see, those unlucky enough to be in a relationship with David Carrick would suffer the most severe abuse. Not only would he be punishing them for daring to be female, a gender he despised, but he would also be doing whatever he could to control and utterly destroy them so they would not abandon him. No doubt he fantasised about acts of sexual violence towards women, and I believe there are indicators that for most of his adult life, David Carrick was not able to perform sexually unless the women he was with were in pain or in a state of absolute terror. So, returning back to the timeline of events, David Carrick joined the British Army in 1996 when he was 19 years old, and I've no doubt this had nothing to do with serving his country. This was about getting into a position of power, with him likely having fantasies of being an officer, sending men and women onto the battlefield whilst he got medals pinned to his chest. I believe there were likely other reasons why he wanted to join the army, but I'll circle back to that much later. However, like so many others I've covered on this channel, he couldn't hack it, and after just 12 months, he left the army. He then moved north to Yorkshire and then back south to London. David Carrick then began looking at other opportunities where he could gain power and identified the Metropolitan Police Force in London, known as the Met. Just a few short years later, he would join, but this predator would soon start showing indicators of the dangerous 
sadistic psychopath he truly is. The first incident of concern that we know about occurred in the year 2000 when David Carrick was around 25 years old. Carrick had recently broken up with a girlfriend and was harassing her. When she was out, he broke into her home and stole perfume and lingerie. His ex called the Metropolitan Police, which covers London, and Carrick was spoken to. It was agreed that no further action would be taken if the items were returned. This occurred, and so Carrick was not arrested. A few months later, this same woman called the police again, saying that Carrick was making malicious calls to her, which were threatening and intrusive. Again, Carrick was not arrested, and there were no consequences for him. Although he'd not been arrested, crime reports were uploaded against his name on the police computer. This is an extremely small indicator of what was to come. David Carrick was a man you didn't say no to. He got what he wanted, and despite the police intervening, that meant nothing. The rules didn't apply to him. The next year, 2001, David Carrick applied to join the Metropolitan Police Force. As part of this process, he was vetted. The specifics of the vetting process are secret, for obvious reasons, as people would find a way to circumvent it. But generally, it involves an applicant being looked into to determine if there's anything that suggests they're untrustworthy or susceptible to blackmail. This can include checking their criminal history and whether they're experiencing financial difficulties. In this case, someone somewhere must have seen that, despite Carrick not having been arrested or convicted for an offence, there were two crime reports from a woman raising concerns about his behaviour. However, this was clearly deemed to not be a problem, because in August 2001, 26-year-old David Carrick was hired and became Constable 2752 with the Metropolitan Police Force, and he was initially based at Merton in south-west London. He had his wish. He now had a privileged position, and he was keen to wield his new power. In 2002, so only months after joining the force and still in his probationary period, a woman called the police and reported that Carrick had harassed her and assaulted her when she broke up with him. The assault involved Carrick biting this woman's shoulder, an act specifically intended to cause pain, another sign of this man's intention to cause females as much harm as possible. Carrick wasn't arrested, but a report was logged, and he was spoken to about this, and I'm sure he twisted it to make himself seem like the victim, and the case was closed. So despite him being accused by two separate women of harassment in the space of just two years, David Carrick continued with his training. This same year, two separate members of the public complained that David Carrick had been rude to them whilst in uniform on patrol. He treated these people with contempt and told one to fuck off. Over the next six years, Carrick would receive five further complaints, which were again about his rude and dismissive behaviour, as well as accusations of excessive force. School friends who knew Carrick, after he became a police officer, noticed the change in him. He was arrogant and cocky. One stated, quote, Carrick's favourite trick was to flash his warrant card in front of friends on a night out. There were times when he'd see people rowing in the pub or being too loud, who would flash his card tell them he's an off-duty officer and to calm it down or they'll be arrested. It was a power thing to him, almost like, look at me, see what I can do. And that's it in a nutshell. David Carrick wanted the uniform, the warrant card, the power. He didn't care about protecting and serving the public. His only interest was in himself. He wanted to see the colour drain from the face of people when he told them he was a police officer. Watch all their bravado melt away. And less than two years after joining the police, David Carrick would begin to use his power and authority to engage in a campaign of rape against at least 15 women, which included women he met in bars, online, and even two fellow police officers. I'll go through each attack in turn. The survivors were referred to by letters in court to protect their anonymity. However, rather than referring to them as such, I'm going to come up with pseudonyms. So, for example, victim A could be Amanda. I think use of the name, rather than the letter, helps reinforce that these are all real women whose lives have been irreparably damaged by the actions of this monster. There were some who bravely came forward and spoke to the papers to share their harrowing stories, so there were a lot of disturbing details related to some of the attacks, which I'll go through. 
Again, the warning from the beginning of the video applies. The next two sections are disturbing. So the first rape committed by David Carrick that can be proved in court, but inevitably not his first, as we'll come back to you later, occurred in October 2003 when he met 20-year-old Tina at a bar. A mutual acquaintance introduced the pair, and they hit it off. Carrick appeared warm and charming. Tina made it clear immediately that she was in a relationship, and so I was not looking for anything more than a chat. Carrick the gentleman said that was completely fine. He then invited her to a housewarming party at his flat in Tooting, southwest London. Tina was reluctant, but stated later, quote, I was a bit cautious about it, but he said, I'm the safest person you can be with. I'm a police officer. Nothing's going to happen to you. To reinforce that she wasn't in any danger, he showed her his police ID to demonstrate he wasn't lying. When she got to the flat, she found there was no party, and she was alone with Carrick. However, he assured her others would soon be joining them. He poured Tina a drink and began to try and kiss her. She said she was not interested and went into the bathroom. When she came out, she asked when the other people were arriving, and Carrick said he'd cancel the party as he was tired. And so Tina collected her belongings and went to leave, but she found the door was locked. In an instant, David Carrick changed, and Tina later described what happened next. Quote, That's when the attack began. I remember him putting his right arm around my waist and his left hand around my mouth and dragging me back in. He hit my head in the hallway as I was struggling with him. He pushed me onto the end of the bed, and as he was pinning me down, he had his knee on my thigh and his hand over my mouth, and I bit him. I heard him reaching around in a box at the end of the bed, and that's when the gun appeared. He said, If you behave yourself, I'll let you go. You carry on, you won't be leaving here. When I saw the gun, I froze. He brushed it against my cheek, and I could feel the cold metal. I thought, that's it. He's going to rape me, and then he's going to kill me. I remember as the attack was happening, I went to close my eyes, and he put his hands on my throat and said, No, no, you're going to want to be awake for this. Open your eyes. Carrick then raped Tina repeatedly, both vaginally and anally, and she continued, He also pulled out clumps of my hair and held me by the throat. He was vicious, he was evil. Evil is the only way I can describe him. In the morning, David Carrick acted like nothing had happened. He told Tina, quote, You best go now. I've got work later on. He unlocked the door, stood outside his flat naked, and waved her on her way. Checking the time, Tina saw that her ordeal had lasted nine hours. She then called her GP and told them she'd been raped, and she was told to go to hospital. She did so and was examined by a nurse. Tina told the nurse that she'd been raped by a police officer, and horrifyingly, the nurse apparently said, quote, You're not the first woman to come in here and say a police officers raped them. It's not clear whether she was referring to previous victims of David Carrick or other officers. This nurse then dissuaded Tina from reporting the crime, telling her that, quote, They're going to go through your history and put you through hell. They will discredit you as much as possible because they look after their own. So Tina didn't report it and tried to get on with her life, but this was destroyed. She had flashbacks for years and became a recluse. She was a woman who'd lost confidence in herself, everyone else, and especially the police. After Carrick's arrest in 2021, she contacted the police and made an official complaint. It was never determined whether the gun Carrick used was real. It's always maintained that this didn't happen. David Carrick's next attack demonstrates his feelings of invincibility when he targeted one of his own, a serving female police officer, who will call Victoria. In the spring of 2004, Victoria was a 38-year-old officer who works on the opposite side of London, but the pair ended up in the same station in Wimbledon, southwest London, for a short time as part of a traffic patrol unit. Carrick and Victoria began a relationship, but looking back on it, Victoria could see there were elements of controlling behaviour. If she was talking to a male colleague or a member of the public, Carrick would suddenly appear and put his arm around her, but not in a comforting or affectionate way, in a way to demonstrate that she was his, his possession, and to get the other man to back off. One night, after a long shift, the pair went back to his flat and tooting and got into bed. They began being intimate, and Victoria later stated 
that she expected they were going to have consensual vaginal sex. However, he then began to initiate anal sex. When Victoria tried to push him off, he simply stated, quote, we're doing it this way, and raped her. The next morning, Carrick showed absolutely no sign of any sort of emotion. No remorse, no concern, nothing. Victoria left and actively avoided Carrick for the next two weeks while they were in the same building before he moved to another station. Victoria came forward when Carrick was arrested in 2021 and it's clear she felt a lot of guilt for not reporting her attack. She stated that at the time, the police was very male-dominated and that, quote, women weren't encouraged to speak up about officers' misconduct. It was drummed into us. She feared if she spoke up, rather than being supported, she would be vilified and lose her career. Just months later, still in 2004, Carrick again abused a woman he was in a quote-unquote relationship with. No specific details of this incident have been publicised or whether it was reported to the police at the time. I say relationship in quotation marks because Carrick was incapable of this type of connection with someone. He saw women as objects to use and abuse. The next victim was Fiona, who first met David Carrick when she was 21 years old and working as a barmaid in 2008. Carrick was 12 years older than her and began to charm Fiona and the pair soon began a relationship. Fiona decided that she wanted to be in the police and unlike the monster that is David Carrick, she actually wanted to help other people. After she joined up, the pair bought a house together in Stevenage in Hertfordshire. Behind closed doors, Fiona was subjected to horrific sexual violence. Carrick was her first sexual partner and he repeatedly raped her vaginally and anally over the space of three years. She felt she couldn't tell her police colleagues that she would not be believed and potentially shunned by others and seen as trying to end the career of an officer who had seven years service by this point, whereas she was just a trainee. When Fiona eventually broke away from Carrick and left him, he took a kitchen knife and threatened to kill her while shredding her police uniforms. Carrick was a persistent and prolific predator. Whilst abusing one woman, he was searching for other victims, and this is highlighted by his crimes in 2009. So not only was he raping Fiona at this time, but early in the year, Hertfordshire police received a call accusing him of abusing a woman. This appears to have been a different woman and not Fiona. No action was taken, but Hertfordshire police did contact the Met and informed them of the allegation. However, this was simply recorded and no action was taken. So another woman had accused David Carrick of domestic abuse and he was allowed to remain in his job, which inevitably would have involved coming into contact with vulnerable women who had suffered the same abuse that he himself was likely perpetrating. In fact, David Carrick was not remonstrated, he was essentially promoted. Around this time, he was transferred to the Parliamentary and Diplomatic Protection Command. This is an elite unit within the police, whose role, as the name suggests, is to guard locations and people relevant to national security, including the Houses of Parliament, embassies and Downing Street. These officers are armed as part of their duties, so now they've given a rapist and domestic abuser a gun. This is the same unit that Wayne Cousins worked in. So David Carrick had abused multiple women and his life had actually improved. He now had more power. His feelings of invincibility must have increased. He was untouchable and that potentially explains the number of offences he committed during 2009. Within days of becoming an armed police officer, Carrick attended a social event for a martial arts club he was part of. During the night, he met Sarah. The pair had both been drinking and she agreed to come back to his home. When she got there, Sarah thought better of the situation, but Carrick wouldn't take no for an answer. He stripped naked and forced Sarah onto the bed. He then challenged her to try and get him off of her, taking great enjoyment in watching her squirm under his weight. He then tried to rape Sarah, but couldn't achieve an erection and became angry. He then kicked her out with a reminder that he was a police officer and that no one would believe her. In August 2009, David Carrick went to a school reunion at a pub in Wiltshire. Witnesses later stated that he was arrogant and kept boasting about his job in the police. A former friend of Carrick's described his behaviour on that night, stating, quote, I could tell at the reunion that he had become very confident in himself, but I suppose that now makes sense because we know that by then 
he'd been getting away this stuff for quite a while. His behaviour was cringy, and makes me feel a bit sick now, knowing what we know about him. One of the husbands wouldn't leave his wife's side, as he could see how David was behaving, and I think he overheard what he was saying. He was all over all of the women. He was very confident, even though most of them were married. He was going from one to the next, then he'd go back and try again, bouncing from woman to woman. It was predatory. Due to being far from home, Carrick spent the night in a hotel. It appears that he wormed his way into the room of a woman we'll call Nicola, who he'd known in school and who was sharing her room with a friend. Carrick ended up sleeping in the bed with Nicola, and when he started touching her, she remonstrated him, got up and climbed into bed with her friend. Carrick then dragged Nicola back to the other bed, held her down and put his fingers inside her anus and vagina and tried to rape her. Again, after this incident, Carrick acted as though nothing had happened and told her that this would be, quote, our little secret. Three months later, in November 2009, Carrick was at another social gathering, again for a martial arts club he was part of. It's unclear if this was the same one where he targeted Sarah months before. Here, a woman called Denise became upset during the course of the evening. Carrick offered to take her home. Instead of taking her home, he took her to his flat, stripped her naked, and then forced his fingers into her vagina. So by the end of 2009, David Carrick, despite repeated concerns being raised, was still a serving police officer, and in fact, had been given a privileged position within the ranks. He'd also attacked multiple women, raping at least three of them, including two police officers. Unfortunately, there would be many more victims, and his reign of terror will continue for more than a decade. The crimes I've described so far are horrific, but they are nothing compared to the degradation and depravity that he subjected some of his later victims to. There's then a break in David Carrick's offending, with the next incident occurring, according to court records in 2015. I've no doubt there were further attacks on more victims in this six-year period. His promotion from a beat cop to an armed officer whose role was to protect diplomats and sites integral to national security would have made him feel even more invincible than before, and I don't believe for a second, given how many women he attacked in 2009, that he would have suddenly stopped. David Carey was a serial rapist, a doubt he could control his urges for six days, let alone six years, nor did he want to. On November the 7th, 2015, David Carrick met Karen, a woman that he knew from school. It appears they'd been in contact over the years, and she agreed to go on a date with him. The evening went well. Carrick was flirtatious, charming and attentive. He told her he was in the police, and she was impressed. However, this was part of his ritual, show them his badge to lower their defences, and also to leave them in no doubt who was in charge and who would be believed when he eventually attacked them. Carrick and Karen went back to his property and started having sex. However, he then began having anal sex with her and she told him to stop. Carrick didn't listen. He held Karen down and brutally raped her. She suffered internal injuries which left her in pain for days. As I said earlier in the video, the people most at risk from David Carrick were those women unfortunate enough to end up in a relationship with him. They would not only have to deal with the punishment that Carrick believed they deserved due to simply being female, but also his controlling and degrading treatment intended to utterly destroy them so they wouldn't leave him. By 2016, David Carrick was scouring internet dating sites looking for women to abuse, and this is where he met Bianca. Bianca was vulnerable. She was in a deeply unhappy marriage, which was ending, and was concerned about being a single mother raising her 10-year-old daughter. Carrick sensed her distress and presented himself as the answer to her prayers. He was charming and bombarded her with attention. He was a police officer. She would be safe with him. His position appears to have been the primary reason why Bianca agreed to move in with Carrick soon after the relationship began in late 2016. However, he didn't want her to bring her daughter with her. This was a red flag, but unfortunately Bianca didn't see it. If he was so caring, why would he want to separate her from her child? Clearly he didn't want any witnesses or anyone standing in the way of him achieving his goal of completely dominating this woman. However, Bianca did bring her daughter with her and unfortunately this child was witness to much of the horror that her mother experienced 
over the course of her six-month relationship with David Carrick. Almost from the moment that Bianca moved in, Carrick sought to utterly control her. He set rules on when she could eat, and Bianca was effectively starved, meaning she dropped five dress sizes in just a matter of months. He saw cameras in the home, which he would use to watch her during the day whilst he was at work. She was forbidden from working or leaving the house without his express permission. Carrick cut Bianca off from her friends and family, made her delete her social media, and would check her phone regularly to make sure she was not in contact with any other men. Carrick would repeatedly rape Bianca, with her 10-year-old daughter having to listen to the cries and screams of her mother. On one occasion, when she was recovering from an operation to remove hemorrhoids, Carrick raped Bianca, which resulted in tearing to her anus. There was also an incident when Carrick demanded oral sex and Bianca refused because her daughter had young friends over and they were in the next room. Carrick didn't care. He forced his penis into Bianca's mouth, gagging her to the point where she couldn't breathe. After six months of abuse, Bianca was able to escape with the help of her sister, taking her daughter with her, but the long-term damage had only just begun. Bianca was left a suicidal, broken woman who for years and likely for the rest of her life was having flashbacks about the trauma she suffered. I imagine that Bianca escaping the clutches of David Carrick increased his anger towards females. How dare any woman leave him? He believed he should be able to treat them like objects, his possessions, in any way he wanted. With the next victim, he would make sure that she was so brutalised that she would have no doubt who was in charge. This unfortunate woman was Jasmine, who met David Carrick in a bar in the city of Ely in Cambridgeshire. Carrick was off duty and was on a night out with other officers. At the time she met Carrick, Jasmine was in her 40s and had three grown-up children. She was in a relationship, but this was coming to an end and she was unhappy and had been so for a number of years. She was approached by Carrick, who said that he was an armed officer in the police and that he guarded the Queen, the Prime Minister and even President Obama on a state visit. Jasmine was enamoured with Carrick and the relationship moved extremely quickly. Again, as with his last victim, Bianca, Jasmine moved in with David Carrick in his home in Stevenage within weeks of the relationship beginning. The abuse began immediately after she moved in. Carrick controlled every aspect of Jasmine's life, including how often she ate, what she ate, and even what side of the street she was allowed to walk on. Sometimes he would only allow her to eat three chicken nuggets a day, telling her that she was, quote, fat and disgusting. He also called her a prostitute and a whore. Carrick would send pictures of himself at work holding his firearm. On one occasion, one of these photos came with a message which said, quote, Remember, I am the boss. Carrick belittled Jasmine's job as a mental health worker, telling her that this was a waste of time, as all people with mental health issues should be shot. One of Jasmine's sons was living in a mental health facility, and Carrick banned her from seeing him for over a year. Carrick threatened to murder Jasmine and said that he was looking forward to pissing on her grave. David Carrick forced Jasmine to give up her career so that he could control her every minute of every day. When he was at work, he would watch her and talk to her through the cameras installed in the home. He would also check her phone and showed pathological jealousy, accusing her of cheating on him even though he knew she'd not even left the house. She was forced to clean the house naked and Carrick would shut Jasmine in a small cupboard, sometimes for hours, despite her screaming and on one occasion while she was having a panic attack. Jasmine was subjected to horrific sexual violence, being anally raped repeatedly over the two-year relationship. This often resulted in significant internal injuries and Jasmine would frequently be bleeding from her anus. Carrick didn't care who was around. One of the anal rapes occurred whilst they were on a camping trip with Jasmine's family. Whilst her family were in the adjoining tent, Carrick placed his hand over Jasmine's mouth and raped her. He would also orally rape Jasmine, forcing his penis down her throat to the point where she was unable to breathe and would vomit, but he wouldn't stop. He also attempted to force his fist and forearm inside her vagina on a number of occasions. Carrick would also urinate over Jasmine's body and in her mouth, forcing her to swallow this. Any dissent, any non-compliance would result in Carrick beating Jasmine, which he did with various objects, including a leather whip. He would also threaten to kill her if she reported him and made it clear that no one would believe her and even if they did, 
she wouldn't live to testify in court. The abuse Jasmine suffered went on for almost two years, from March 2017 to January 2019. How the relationship came to an end is unclear, but she was able to escape with her life. She was broken and traumatised through continuous brutalisation. Whilst Carrick expected complete subservience from women and expected them not to even talk to another man, he was free to do whatever he wanted. And so, whilst abusing Jasmine, he was already looking for other victims. In 2017, police received a complaint of domestic abuse and this appears to have not been related to Jasmine and so this is yet another victim. Carrick was not arrested, but this was logged on the police system. Also in 2017, Carrick went through the process of renewing his vetting. This should have been done in 2010, but due to a massive backlog, it had never happened. By this point, even though the police didn't have information about the rapes he was committing, they had even more complaints from women accusing him of domestic abuse than when he was first vetted. However, again, despite these concerns, he passed vetting and continued as an armed police officer. In July 2018, Carrick met Whitney on an internet dating site. She worked as a cleaner, but only part-time, and wanted to work more hours. He offered her a job, saying he wanted her to work for him. Carrick said that he was a police officer, and he'd run a background check on her, so he knew he could trust her. Whitney took the job. On one occasion, when she was cleaning his shower, Carrick forced his penis into her mouth, gagging her so much she couldn't breathe. He ejaculated in her mouth, which caused her to vomit. Afterwards, Carrick told Whitney that if she told anyone, he would plant drugs in her vehicle and get her sent to prison for years. Whether Jasmine was in another part of the house when this happened is unclear. Later that year, and again when he was repeatedly raping and abusing Jasmine, Carrick met Paula on an internet dating site. She was extremely vulnerable. She had a mild learning disability and suffered with mental health problems. He regaled her with stories about his job as an armed police officer. She wanted people to like her, and this extended to Carrick, and he took full advantage of this. Carrick began calling her, quote, slave, and forced Paula to clean his house. On at least three occasions, he orally raped her, forcing his penis down her throat so she couldn't breathe. He also forced his fist inside of her body and a sex toy into her anus, or while she was screaming for him to stop. He would sometimes force her naked into the shower, and while she lay cowering on the floor, he would urinate on her. In February 2020, Carrick met Faye through a dating site, and within weeks, she'd moved into his home. It appears that Faye was again a vulnerable woman. She was an immigrant, and she'd only been in the country a short time. She had no one she could turn to. Again, the same pattern of controlling behaviour was evident, with Carrick restricting Faye's movements, when she ate, and who she spoke to. He only raped her repeatedly, causing her to bleed, and would degrade her by urinating in her mouth and on her face. If she resisted in any way, he would state he had friends in immigration, and he could get her deported. As I'll reiterate later, and I'm sure some of you have thought, David Carrick was a serial killer in the making. I'm surprised to some extent that he had not reached this point already, but I think this was imminent. However, luckily, his campaign of rape, degradation, and I would add torture of women would soon finally come to an end, but not before at least one more victim. In 2021, David Coat raped at least one more woman, who we shall call Jane. She didn't make a formal complaint, as she didn't want to go through the trauma of going to court, but she did share her story in interviews with the media after Carrot was arrested. Her words are important, and I'll use them extensively, as they show the utter depravity of Carrick, the tactics he used, and his level of evil. Jane met Carrick on Tinder, and quote, In the beginning, he was a really nice guy. He was very chatty, very polite. I thought I had found the right person. To her friends and family, he would appear like a gentleman, a man in a trusted position in the police. However, when they were not around, he would put Jane down, commenting on her weight and appearance. He also tried to isolate her from her family, and Jane later reported, quote, He did it in a nice way, saying, Your family are grown up. You need to let them live their life. Jane was not allowed to use social media, and Carrick would repeat the same phrases over and over again, saying, quote, 
Who do you belong to? You belong to me. You have to obey me. You're here to serve me. Jane said that Kate was sexually obsessed and was fixated with emulating violent sexual acts. He would send her pornographic videos whilst on duty and ask her to perform the acts shown. Initially, when she said no, he would emotionally blackmail her by sending sad face selfies. However, as time progressed, he would simply rape Jane and this happened repeatedly. As well as sexual violence, Kayak would torment Jane. He would handcuff her and then claim he'd lost the key, leaving her in this state for hours before suddenly discovering it. He would also repeatedly threaten Jane a reminder of the consequences if she ever dared report him to the authorities, with him saying, quote, I look after the Prime Minister, so you'd better behave yourself. I'm a powerful man. Look at the kind of job I do. Another time he said, I can kill you. I can kill you without leaving any evidence because I work in the police. Like so many of his other victims, Jay was destroyed by this ordeal and she later reported, quote, I blame myself. Why did I let him do this? Why did I let him talk to me like that? I should have straight away gone to the police, but I thought, what if he does what he says? What if he kills me? In July 2021, Soon after Jane was able to escape, Hertfordshire police received a call from a woman accusing David Kayak of raping her in 2020. This is yet another victim, who I cannot comment on as she later withdrew her complaint due to fear. However, before the complaint was withdrawn, David Kayak was actually arrested for the very first time. His arrest on suspicion of rape should have triggered serious action, including looking at his vetting. However, Carrick was allowed to continue in his role, but placed on restricted duties. This would all change when on Friday the 1st of October 2021, another woman called Hertfordshire Police accusing David Carrick of rape in August 2020. I'll call this woman Helen. The details of what she suffered have not been published, and there is a reason for this, which I'll get to later. Her complaint led to David Carrick being arrested for the second and final time in the early hours of Saturday the 2nd of October 2021. Here is body cam footage of his arrest. These are the necessities that I've just explained to you. No necessities, well, okay. keep going. Well, that's, that's one or three, uh, one or four, so, okay. Well, I'll allow you to get, you get some close... What is it you're searching for? Articles for relating to the offences. in St Albans? In 2020. This, this is the allegation that's been made to us, okay, sir? There's no necessity. Yes, there is. I've been a police officer for 20 years. Right, David. Do you want me to come naked like this? No, just understand you're under arrest, I know okay? I'm under just arrest. explain to us what do you need. I'll pull it like this. Don't right. worry about it. Can, can one of my colleagues go and get you stuff? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to? Yeah. yeah. Which one's yours? It's the back one. Okay. Sake. Are you in the investigation? Yeah. Right, okay. Okay. Um. Where are your keys then? We'll bring those at least. Notice the utter contempt from David Carrick. He just exudes arrogance. He might as well be saying, how dare you arrest me? Do you not know who I am? He was taken in for questioning and admitted having sex with Helen, but claimed it was consensual. The police and Crown Prosecution Service didn't believe him. And on October the 3rd, 2021, David Carrick was charged with one count of rape. It was only at this point that the Metropolitan Police suspended him he was eventually officially sacked on the 17th of January 2023. The next day, he appeared via video link at Westminster Magistrates Court and was remanded to prison to await his day in Crown Court. After David Carrick was charged, his name and picture appeared in every newspaper in the country and this prompted other victims of his sexual violence and coercive controlling behaviour to come forward. With each new allegation, Carrick was interviewed. He sat being questioned for hours he either went no comment or wheeled out the same story that any sexual contact was consensual and his victims were lying. But as time went on and more and more women who had no connection to each other each described the same sadistic acts and he was charged with more and more offences, David Carrick's bravado fell away. He knew he was screwed. In total, David Carrick was charged with 50 separate offences related to 13 victims this included 24 counts of rape, 2 counts of attempted rape, 2 counts of false imprisonment 
and three counts of coercive controlling behaviour in an intimate relationship. Whilst awaiting his fate, David Carrick was held at HMP Belmarsh, a maximum security prison in London. He had already indicated that he would plead not guilty to the offence he had been charged with. His defence, any sexual contact was consensual, they were all lying. The trial was set to start on the 6th of February 2023, but Carrick, fucking coward that he is, tries to take the easy way out, and on the 22nd of February 2022, he took a razor and made deep cuts to his neck, wrist and groin. He was airlifted to hospital and then sent back to Belmarsh six days later after receiving treatment. However, due to concerns for his mental health, in July 2022, Carrick was sent to Rampton High Security Psychiatric Hospital in Nottinghamshire, where he stayed until December 2022, when he was deemed well enough to be returned to prison. Time in hospital had clearly given David Carrick time to think, and he indicated that he would plead guilty to all the remaining charges. I say remaining charges because the rape allegation made by Helen, which triggered the downfall of Carrick, was eventually dropped. And so, at two hearings, one on the 13th of December 2022 and another on the 16th of January 2023, David Carrick pleaded guilty to 49 offences, including 23 counts of rape, spanning 17 years. In the dock, Carrick had aged significantly and had lost considerable weight. His case was then adjourned for a probation pre-sentence report to be prepared. On the 7th of February 2023, David Carrick stood before Mrs Justice Chima Grubb for sentence at Southwark Crown Court. It was clear from the pre-sentence report that Carrick had no intention of taking full responsibility for his actions. Despite pleading guilty to everything, he claimed that he could not remember any of the sexual attacks or the most depraved acts of degradation against any of his victims. This was clearly bullshit. The coward wouldn't admit what he did. His guilty pleas were just in the hopes of getting a reduced sentence. This is another one of those cases where cameras were allowed in to film the sentence, and so I'll include part of this. A link to the full recording will be in the description. I consider that the seriousness of the offence with which I have to sentence you is such as to justify the imposition uh, of, as a last resort of a sentence of imprisonment for life. Indeed, only such a sentence will meet the gravity of the offending I have to deal with you for in combination with the risk you pose. Similarly, for the five offences of rape which fall out with the sentencing code scheme, I'm satisfied that life sentences are required to meet the gravity of the offending and the risk you will continue to pose. I have assessed very carefully whether, given your abusive position, this case should attract a whole life order. The rare sentence of last, last resort is a life sentence with a whole life tariff. In the Crown and McCann, Sinaga and Shah 2020 EWCA CRIM 1676, the Court of Appeal Criminal Division examined conjoined cases involving serious sexual offending on a scale of extreme gravity. Although life sentences with minimum terms to be served of 40 years were appropriate after trial, None of those cases reached the threshold for a whole life tariff in the view of the court. None of those offenders was a policeman, and the court did not have drawn to their attention any potential scenario close to the one presented to this court. However, the prosecution specifically does not seek to persuade me that your offending fits the description of, quotes, wholly exceptional circumstances which the court indicated would justify such an order. I've also scrutinised the judgment of the court in another recent conjoined case, the Crown and Stewart Cousins Tustin and Hughes, 2022 EWCA CRIM 1063, in which the offender Cousins appealed against the whole life order imposed on him, following a notorious abduction of a young woman from the streets of London, accomplished while he was an off-duty police officer by use of his warrant card, followed by her rape and murder. 
the court accepted that police officers are in a uniquely powerful position. In respect of the fixing of minimum terms where a mandatory life sentence is required by law, as set out in Schedule 21 of the Sentencing Code, a different scheme to the one I have to apply. Lord Burnett, Chief Justice, stated the principle, quote, in our view, the correct approach is to focus on the facts which in a rare case might lead to the conclusion that a whole life order is appropriate, close quote. At paragraph 83, having explained the correct route to a whole life order in that case, he continued, quote, this was, as the judge said, warped, selfish and brutal offending which was both sexual and homicidal. It was a case with unique and extreme aggravating features Chief amongst these, as the judge correctly identified, was the grotesque misuse by cousins of his position as a police officer with all that connated to facilitate Miss Everard's kidnap, rape and murder. We agree with the observations of the judge about the unique position of the police, the critical importance of their role and the critical trust the public repose in them. End of quote. Had the court in McCann imagined the facts of this case, would they have equated it to the gravity of the near-miss mass murder attempt or the foiled terrorist atrocity, which the court considered would compel a court to attach a whole life tariff to a discretionary life sentence? The standout feature is the element of abuse of the status of a police constable. But having considered the matter with care, I've come to the same conclusion as the prosecution. Of the utmost gravity though this is, the wholly exceptional circumstances test is not met. Thus, the imposition of a discretionary life sentence without a whole life tariff must be accompanied by an evaluation of the notional determinate term that would have been required to mark the gravity of the total offending had a life sentence not been imposed. That term provides the start of the calculation required to reach a minimum term an offender must serve. It must be for the shortest term that is commensurate with the seriousness of the offences before the court. <coughs> Mr Williamson, King's counsel, in his, distinct and, in his succinct and well-focused mitigation submits that the criminality before this court does not reach the extreme limits found in the cases of the offenders McCann and Sinaga. I do not agree. Your offending was over 17 years and encompassed 12 victims. Moreover, the singular element which elevates your offending as a brutal serial rapist into that company is the principal aggravating feature of the explicit or implicit use of your occupation to entice, reassure, or intimidate your victims. I have to bear in mind that my function is to impose appropriate punishment. And when that is served, the parole board will decide how to protect the public thereafter. Decades will have passed before that time comes. I conclude that the notional determinate sentence that would provide a just and proportionate punishment is 60 years. To that guilty plea, a discount of 20% will be applied. It is to your credit that you did not contest a trial. Your decision deserves this recognition because there is no doubt that a court hearing at which evidence is given and challenged provides a particular ordeal for victims. From the resulting term of 48 years, I have to set two-thirds minus the time spent so far in custody, which is 491 days. Stand up, David Carrick. I've made ancillary orders for deprivation pursuant to section 153 of the Sentencing Act 2020 and restraining orders under sections 359 and 360 of the Act. They will remain in force until further order. <coughs> the victim surcharge applies. I make no sexual harm prevention orders given the nature of the sentence I'm about to pass. On the main indictment on counts 16, 19, 29, 30, 31, 32, 38, 39, 42 and 43, 
the sentence is four years' imprisonment on each concurrent. On counts 24 and 25, the sentence is seven years on each concurrent. On count six, on the second indictment, I impose a concurrent determinate sentence of nine years. 31 sentences of life imprisonment are imposed on the main indictment on counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, 26, 27, 28, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 40 and 41. Also, five life sentences are imposed on the second indictment on counts 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. This makes a total of 36 life sentences. The minimum term you will have to serve before the parole board can think of releasing you is 30 years, 239 days. And you may go down. Mr Little, Mr Williamson, the court salutes the courage of all the victims and their families, and I hope they're able to thrive in the rest of their lives. The teams of police officers concerned have worked hard to bring this case to court and to keep the confidence of the victims. To do so under the fierce scrutiny this case has attracted is promising for the future. The Crown Prosecution Service lawyers and counsel have met tight deadlines set by the court and put the case together fairly and effectively. The defence team has met the challenge of dealing with an evolving set of grave allegations and a completely disorientated client with patience and professionalism. The court wishes to recognise that work and to thank all of you. So, to clarify, for his reign of terror, which spanned almost two decades, David Carrick was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 30 years. He was 48 years old when he was sentenced, so taking into account time on remand, he will be eligible for parole in around 2052 when he's 77. I don't believe David Carrick will ever be released. When he comes up for parole, if he's still alive, I think there'll be such a public outcry that any chance of release will be blocked and he'll die behind prison walls. The next 30 years at least will be hell on earth for David Carrick. He's a former cop, surrounded by people who, many of them, despise authority and are capable of horrific acts of violence. Tell you what, maybe he can make a little police ID badge in his cell or someone can send him a little sheriff's badge or police badge, and he can flash that to the other inmates and see where that gets him. I just want to make it clear that when I give the background to these people, it's just about understanding a sort of intellectual exercise to see the progression of how they became the person they became. It's not about gaining any sympathy for them or mitigating what they've done. Personally, I think that someone like David Carrick should be put down. He's forfeit his right to life. I think that someone else may take that decision into their own hands sometime in the future, and I for one would not shed a tear if I read that he'd been murdered in prison. The crimes of Wayne Cousins and David Carrick shocked the nation, and it's only got worse as more stories were published by people with inside information about the Metropolitan Police. They're a closed force, a law unto themselves. Despite it being the 21st century, there are certain issues of misogyny, racism and homophobia, which means that those who don't fit a specific criteria are left to fend for themselves, even if everyone is fully aware that they are being victimised. The crimes of Cousins and Carrick meant that the Met had questions to answer, and the information they disclosed was shocking. In early 2023, the Met disclosed that there were 1,071 officers and staff who were still employed by the force despite allegations of domestic abuse or sexual violence being made against them. They vowed to review these cases. To give you an idea of the type of officers that have been employed by the Metropolitan Police, I want to give you an example of a recent disciplinary hearing. The results of misconduct panels held by all forces are public record and I'll leave a link to the website 
for the Met so you can read through the various cases which shows what the officer has been accused of and what the outcome was. You can even attend the hearings if you want to. Anyway, so the hearing I want to talk about was held on the 28th of February 2024 and related to Police Constable David Seeger. According to the paperwork, he was accused of two things, but it's the first of these I want to focus on, and this reads, quote, Between February and December 2020, you sent repeated messages referencing sexual violence, rape, forced impregnation, and slavery in the context of sexual fantasy to Miss A. It goes on to indicate that he sent this woman, who he met only briefly, amongst other things, a long story outlining a fantasy related to rape and slavery within a white supremacy context. What this means specifically is unclear, but I imagine he's a white officer and the woman he targeted is black, and his fantasy involves some sort of domination and rape with her potentially pretending she was a slave and he was a slave owner. Things only got worse, so PZ Seeger essentially said he should not be held accountable as those messages were sent outside of working hours and he had a right to privacy. He also tried to blackmail the force, stating, quote, I was much more valuable as a serving police officer than I am as an enemy. I am currently exploring avenues of very publicly suing the police. I will spend the rest of my life defaming the Metropolitan Police Service as hard as I can. I mean, how fucked up is that? This guy sends messages to a woman which are racist and include fantasies about rape and he is going to sue the Met and this man was a police officer. P.C. Seeger is described as quote an absolute disgrace to the profession who clearly doesn't understand or reflect the values of the service. He was fired without notice and banned from ever working for the police again. Whilst it's positive that this creature now no longer works for the police there are a couple of things to point out. Firstly how many more like him are there? Secondly, notice that the allegations are from 2020 and this was only heard in 2024. With this sort of a timescale, at this rate, it will likely take years, maybe a decade, to get all the dangerous officers off the force. An independent inquiry is being conducted to look at the case of David Carrick, specifically in order to provide a detailed overview of the mistakes and decisions that led him to be allowed to operate without any consequences for almost two decades. The report likely won't be published until later this year. I imagine it will be an eye-opener. I just want to say that I have so much respect for the survivors in this case. Their anonymity was granted by the court, likely because they just want to get on with their lives. I wish them nothing but peace. But also, I want to say that we owe them a debt of thanks by coming forward, which I have no doubt was absolutely terrifying, that made sure the monster that is David Carrick is now exposed and languishing in a prison cell exactly where he should be. The same goes for anyone, male or female, who is a survivor of sexual abuse. The people who did this to you are the weak ones. Your strength I utterly admire. It's easy for me to say, and likely very hard for you to accept, but nothing that happened to you was your fault. Please don't blame yourself. You're awesome, and I respect you for just getting up each and every day and putting one foot in front of the other. That is true bravery, and you should never forget that. I mean, what to say about David Carrick? He is truly evil. A man whose whole life was devoted to rape and degradation. His sole focus was brutalizing women. I've already outlined my thoughts on his profile, but to reiterate, at the core of Carrick was pure hatred of women. I think this stemmed from his mother due to her divorcing his father, her neglecting him as a child, her choosing a violent abuser over his father, and her exposing him to violence in the home. He wanted to hurt women, destroy them. They were all bitches, slags, whores, and should be treated as such. However, there was also the little boy who became a man who had low self-esteem and a fear of rejection, who desperately needed the very woman he hated to bolster how he felt about himself and fill the deep dark hole of emptiness inside of him. When he was in a relationship with them, he was terrified they would leave him, and so he needed to do whatever it took to make sure they wouldn't abandon him. 
and so he destroyed the person they were and essentially turned them into a slave, someone there to do his bidding. As I highlighted, I think the people most at risk of Carrick were those he was in a relationship with. Please don't misunderstand, David Carrick has risked to all women. However, as his offences show, his partners would not only have to deal with acts of rape, but also his controlling coercive behaviour. He went to horrific lengths to brutalise these women, to destroy them. Everything that David Carrick did was well thought out, and he chose specific acts which would cause as much pain and distress to the women he attacked as possible, including only raping them, urinating on them, putting his fists inside of them, and forcing his penis down their throats to the point where they couldn't breathe and would vomit. All of these acts he also found sexually arousing. He was a sexual sadist. I think it's clear that for much of his adult life, he couldn't get an erection unless the women he was with were literally crying and screaming in fear. He also showed no remorse, no emotion and no empathy. In my opinion, David Carrick clearly displays psychopathic traits. His offending was facilitated by his role in the police. He used the natural trust that a lot of us have in police officers to his advantage. I mean he's a police officer, surely he joined up to protect people. He must be a good guy. And this is the reason why Kate joined the police, for this power, and I have no doubt that he always intended to use it to rape women. This was after dropping out of the army after only a year. I mentioned earlier that I think there were other reasons why he wanted to join the armed forces than just wishing to have power over people. Firstly, to get the uniform and the gravitas of saying he was a soldier. I think he believed this would make it more likely that he could entice women out in the world. However, secondly, I think that he also wanted to join because he was aware that the army is another organisation which has an appalling record of dealing with sexual abuse within the ranks. I believe he saw a career in the armed forces as a way to obtain a steady stream of women to rape who, even if they screamed from the rooftops, would not be believed. Potentially there's a reason why he joined the Met. He knew how misogynistic the culture was. When Carrie got his police uniform, I imagine he considered himself akin to a god. He was now untouchable. The inaction of the police built on this arrogance and delusion. It's been reported that David Carrick was well known for his behaviour. He was known as quote, Bastard Dave because of his cruelty towards offenders and members of the public alike. He was also a lech. He would flirt with any woman he came into contact with and would slap them on the bottom. I'd be curious what was said to him when he was actually spoken to about accusations from women who accused him of domestic abuse. I imagine it was justifying his behaviour. It's clear that Carrick felt confident in acting in any way that he wanted, and this included being cruel to the very people he was meant to protect and sexually harassing his co-workers. All of this was seen as a joke, and when he abused women out in the world and was spoken to about this, it was just a quiet word in his ear. So in his mind, there would be no consequences to him attacking women both within and outside of the force, and he did both. A lot has been made of the fact that Wayne Cousins and David Carrick were in the same unit in the Met. I get why, and people have asked did they know each other, did they hang out? The answer is we don't know. Some reports say they knew each other, others say they were complete strangers. Even those that say that they knew each other stated they weren't friends or close. I guess people are trying to work out whether they shared their fantasies, maybe encourage the others to commit their crimes. I think this is very unlikely. However, I think the point has been missed. The real question that should be asked is why did both of these men want to be in this armed unit specifically? I think the answer is likely that they both wanted to feel powerful. Armed police make up the minority of officers in the UK, so having a gun set them, in their mind, above the rank and file. It reinforced the delusions of both Cousins and Carrick that they could do whatever they wanted, including raping and killing women and getting away with it. So hopefully someone has picked up on the main issue underlying all of this. The police is an organisation which will naturally attract sexual psychopaths who want to use the power for their own ends and firearms units are likely to be where these monsters will want to end up. The vetting process needs to be completely revised and include psychological assessments through the roof generally, but even more intensive scrutiny before you hand some the gun. I wouldn't be surprised if there were more men like Wayne Cousins and David Carrick in firearms teams, not only in the Met, but also other forces around the country. 
During the course of this video, I've outlined the 12 victims that David Carrick either raped or attempted to rape, which resulted in conviction, as well as three others that didn't, which makes 15 victims that we know about. However, as I said, there's a six year gap between 2009 and 2015 where there are no recorded offences. This, in my opinion, is simply because he committed crimes that we don't know about during this time. I imagine he raped dozens more women. In general, I think that the 15 victims we know about are just a small fraction of the total number of people that David Carrick violated, and he likely began his campaign of rape long before his first proven offence in 2003 when he was 28 years old. The reason why I think this is because, even with his early offences, it's clear that David Carrick was extremely practiced in what he was doing. He was clearly an expert at selecting targets and getting them alone. He committed acts of sexual violence without hesitation, no sign that he was even concerned that he would be caught. Also, less than three years after joining the police, he raped a fellow officer. These factors show an extremely high level of confidence, which I believe was because David Carrick had been attacking women for years to the point where he thought he could rape a police officer and get away with this. The confidence he got from becoming a police officer and then in the firearms unit, I think likely just built on something that was already there. Also, I find it extremely unlikely that a man like David Carrick only began acting on his fantasies about harming women in his late 20s. I personally am shocked that David Carrick didn't kill any of the women he abused. He was clearly a serial killer in the making. Why he didn't take this step is unclear. I think potentially, once he was arrested, when he was sitting in a prison cell, it probably ran through his mind that he wished he'd killed them. I doubt we will ever know the full extent of David Carrick's offending. Not only is he a man who utterly betrayed the trust and responsibility put in him as a police officer, but I believe he is likely one of the most prolific rapists that the United Kingdom has ever seen. This was a very heavy case and I thank you for sticking it out with me. Please feel free to leave your comments below. If you like the content, then consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button. You can also send a one-off donation to support the channel using the thanks button. Please like, share and subscribe. Take care and I'll see you in the next one.